This is I Hear Things for Thursday, September 2nd, 2021, Little Boxes. You know, I was doing some digital house cleaning the other day, and I, I found an article that I wrote in May of 2005. It may have been the first article I ever published on podcasting, so it was about 16 years ago. I was, I was just a boy. Uh, and it was a first listen to a radio station in San Francisco that called itself KU. The call letters were KYCY. Uh, but KU was America's first podcast radio station. They played podcasts all day long. Uh, and it was, a, it was a delightful, delightful train wreck. Uh, and I wrote a, a first listen about it. And I'm, I'm not going to read from that. I will post a link to everything in the show notes so that you can uh, just imagine how 16 years ago, Younger Tom wrote, which was not appreciably better. Um, but one of the things about listening to podcasts all day long on, uh, on KU, the production value in between the podcasts was very high. It was a commercial radio station, but the production value of the podcasts themselves was, was really, really poor. Um, and I think my conclusion at the time was noble experiment, but if you liked good radio programming, you weren't going to like this station. And if you liked podcasts, you weren't going to like this station because it's not on demand and, and all of the great things that we love about podcasting. It was still a linear over the top experience and kind of neither fish nor fowl. Right. So anyway, it lasted a couple of years. Uh, it was, as I said, a, a noble experiment. And I was thinking about it because we've just passed the two year anniversary of iHeart uh, doing Sunday night podcasts, which they, they do on a number of AM stations around the country. And I still think there's a there there with podcasts on the radio, not for most podcasts. And I, I think they're kind of different experiences. Don't get me wrong. But there is a place, I think, for podcasts on the radio. I think they could be two great tastes that taste great together. But it hasn't really been, it's not been done right, right? It's not been done well, I don't think. And a lot of that, I think, comes down to how long it has taken radio to develop its current relationship with podcasts. And I think Radio's view of podcasting has gone through kind of six steps, right? Step one was, I'm sorry, who are you? Step two was, no, really, who, who are you again? And then we moved into phase three, which was, let us help you. And we saw that a lot at conferences. And then that moved into, no, listen to us. We, we can help you. We can help you. And then that moved into phase five, which is, maybe you can help us. And then now we're in phase six, which is, please help. So there we are. But uh, today, I think even the most successful radio companies realize that there's an incredible amount of podcasting talent outside of their walls, and that podcasting is not just a way to squeeze more juice out of the already almost desiccated lemon of their morning show, but as a showcase for great original spoken word content. And so I think the leaders in the space, at least from the radio side, uh, have understood from uh, for num a number of years now that they can't just grow their own programming internally. They've also gone out to people that are really doing it well. And that's why you've seen acquisitions like How Stuff Works or Pineapple Street. But even with those acquisitions and even with radio's embrace of podcasting, it's still kind of kept in its own tiny little box as far as the broadcast product is concerned. So it is the two-year anniversary, as I mentioned, of iHeart's Sunday Night Podcasts. And this was an hour that was broadcast over a number of AM stations across the country. And it was meant to showcase some of iHeart's uh, original content, things like the Ron Burgundy podcast at the time was what they led with. Now on the surface, this was a great idea. And by the way, it still is, do not get me wrong. And it also, it also works, right? I mean, iHeart built the user base for the iHeart radio app, which is currently used by about 10% of the population. They built the user base for that app entirely on the back of relentless broadcast radio promotion. So that stuff still works and it works well. Do, do not get that twisted. Now, I don't know if Sunday Night Podcasts has been a success for iHeart or not. I mean, I, I hope it has, but I took a spin through a random selection of large and medium market iHeart AM stations to see if it was still on the air and where it was still on the air. And certainly on some of the larger market AMs, uh, like KTRH in Houston or WBZ here in my hometown of Boston, it was not on on Sunday nights. And I think a big reason for that is that those markets had a lot of original local programming happening on those nights, which is commendable. Certainly here in Boston, 
there were a number of local shows on on Sunday night. And on KTRH in Houston, there was a show called The Oil Patch, which I assume is only big in Houston, probably not as big in Schenectady. But then I looked at KEX in Portland and uh, WHAS in Louisville, and they were both featuring Sunday night podcasts. On In Portland, it was on at 6 p.m., and in Louisville, it was on at 9 p.m., so on at different times, but still there, still on the schedule. In San Diego, it's a little bit of a different dog on Kogo, K-O-G-O 600 News Radio. Uh, there's nothing called Sunday night podcasts, but at 6 p.m., there's a one-hour show called Podcast Central, which I assume accomplishes many of the same goals. And by the way, immediately preceding Podcast Central is five hours of Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So extra credit for Kogo. Uh, there's your podcasting cred right there. But now let's look at the most extreme case in the iHeart pantheon. iHeart Podcast AM 1470 in Allentown, Pennsylvania, the Lehigh Valley's all podcast station. iHeart has, de- has dedicated one AM station entirely to podcasts. And if you look at the schedule on the web, and I'm looking at the Monday schedule right now, here it is, Monday, 12 AM to 12 AM podcasts. None more podcasts. Now, to be clear, I'm singling iHeart out here because they are actually doing it. I'm setting them up here as an example, not as a horrible warning. I mean, no one else in the U.S. is doing this. But I do think, for the most part, that radio and podcasting are are two different dogs. They're meant to be consumed differently, for the most part. But one of the themes of so many of my articles and things I've spoken about over the years has been to encourage podcasters to put on a show. Not a podcast, but a show. And guess what? You're doing it. Podcasts today are generally so much better than the ones that KU in San Francisco aired back in 2005. I continue to marvel at the skill and the quality of some of the podcasts that I listen to every week. And if you're listening to my voice right now, you are undoubtedly a better podcaster than I am. I'm not holding myself up as an example podcaster. You are making a show. You're making a real honest to goodness show. And now I think it's time to honor that. To date, I think the early efforts to put podcasts on the radio have been to put them in a box. In the case of uh, podcast AM 1470, the Lehigh Valley's all podcast station, it's just one big box and it just says podcasts. We aren't sure what's in that box. It could be scary. Now, this potentially does mean much greater exposure to an audience that has yet to consciously discover podcasting. But allow me to bring back this data point. This is a data point that I presented at Podcast Movement uh, just a couple of years ago. We did some research on the Americans who are familiar with the term podcasting, but have yet to try one, at least yet to consciously try one. And we asked them what some of their perceived or real barriers to trying a podcast were. 78% of these people who had yet to listen to one said that podcasts just aren't for me. Now, I think those of us who have been around podcasting for a while would agree there is a podcast for everybody. Maybe you just haven't found it yet, but it's out there. But if you haven't discovered that podcast and your received wisdom is that podcasts just aren't for you, then you're likely to see Sunday night podcasts or podcast central on a schedule also as things not for you. And podcast AM 1470 is really not for you 24 freaking hours a day. And that's because podcasting has been put in a little box. It's been othered. It's been othered in a sense, I think, set aside from the regular programming of the station. Now, I don't think your show belongs in a box marked podcasts. And if your show is a show, the next step in this evolution is to tear down the walls of that box. Spotify and YouTube have already obliterated the whole technical definition of what a podcast is, whether anyone likes it or not. So now it's your turn. You get to tear those walls down. If radio is going to go there, let's go there. Let's go there fully. The thing is, we love radio. We've loved radio for decades. Radio at its best is what everyone logging onto Clubhouse is hoping to find, a shared experience. That shared experience It's one of the reasons why Serial became such a big hit. I remember a few years ago, uh, I was on stage uh, at a podcast upfront being interviewed by uh, Jad from Radiolab. 
And he asked me about the significance of Serial. It was fairly new at the time, but still a big hit. And my response to him was that the show gave podcasting its second water cooler moment. The first water cooler moment, we've probably all had this, was when you asked someone if they had ever listened to a specific podcast. And they responded, well, what's a podcast? Well, those little moments happen all the time, and they still do. And that's really what helped to propel the first 10 years or so of growth in podcasting. But that second water cooler moment was when some of us asked a coworker or a friend or a family member, hey, have you ever listened to Serial? And they said yes. Now, radio can also create those shared experiences for podcasts, but only if podcasts are given the tender loving care that they deserve. Fully realized shows that serve a distinct audience. So with that in mind and kind of revisiting Sunday night podcasts, Here are four ways to usher in the next phase of what I think could be for podcasts on the radio. Number one, move into the right neighborhood. Number two, lead with the show, not the medium. Number three, small bites. And number four, audience first. Let's start with the first one. And with that, this assumption, AM radio, really? I think there was a time when many of us, and myself included, I fully own this, entertain the notion that podcasts would be a better option for some AM stations than what they're currently rolling with. Why not put podcasts on AM radio? I don't think this anymore. And I don't think this for two reasons. First of all, while it's true that the current audience for AM content has probably not yet discovered podcasts, so yeah, it's blue ocean. AM is not exactly the best showcase for your work, is it? It's not the best showcase for sound design, all the, all the work that you're doing in studio, it's really not, it's not where you want to be unless you are the type that employs a, a Foley, your coconut shells, the whole works. No, you want that FM hotness, baby. You want that FM. That's where the people are. It's really hard to judge the potential of podcasts on the radio if they're being confined to a band that the radio industry itself is largely not investing in. So there's that. But the second reason has to do with the neighborhood. Now, let's set aside the AM stations that are big market news giants like KYW in Philadelphia or WCBS in New York. They're investing in original local content. We're going to set them aside. A lot of AM programming fits into two buckets. There's brokered programming and syndicated programming. Brokered programs are the ones that are they're paid for up front by the actual host of the show. It's generally a local lawyer, wealth manager, landscaper, supplement dealer, doomsday prepper, cult leader, whatever, they have their own branded call-in show as lead gen for their company. Now, these make money, and they're probably not going to go anywhere as long as AM is kicking around. There's plenty of those throughout the day. That leaves a lot of syndicated programming that's broadcast throughout the country. And for many of the AM stations I looked at while I was researching this podcast, Sunday night is angry white dude night or the cousin of Angry White Dude Night, best of Angry White Dude Night. Putting your comedy or fiction or entertainment podcast in between Angry White Dude number four and Angry White Dude number five on a Sunday night, it's kind of like trying to open a Lululemon in the other mall. You know the one. The one with the Radio Shack and the Spencer's Gifts and the Orange Julius. It is, to quote the great philosopher, Hi McDonough, H.I. McDonough from Raising Arizona, a barren place where your seed can find no purchase. That is unless your podcast is Angry White Dude number 4.5, in which case, welcome home. Second, with the incredible quality that many of you are putting out, I think it's time to lead with the show and not with the medium. Lead with the show, not with the fact that it's a podcast. I'll give you an example of how this could fit in organically on the radio. Uh, As this airs in, in podcast land, Elizabeth Holmes, who is the founder and CEO of Theranos, I'm sure you've heard of her and that company, she's on trial for 12 counts of fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And this case is absolutely bananas. If you haven't read Bad Blood, it's riveting. And there's plenty of AM stations and FM stations, and let's talk about FM stations from now on, that are covering this story. If you're covering business business news, you cannot ignore this story. Now, I don't know how many people would tune into the 9 p.m. podcast hour on those stations. But if, after reporting on this story, 
you got a promo that said, for more on this incredible story, tune into The Dropout tonight at 9 p.m. Would you not be more intrigued? In some ways, offering a podcast hour on a news station is like offering a vinyl hour on a station that normally plays CDs. What's the difference? What music are you going to play? That's what people care about. Thirdly, and on that note, the best way to introduce people to the extraordinary wealth of wonderful podcast content that you are all making might not be with an hour or even a set time block, but a bite. Find a way to put a bite, a small bit, uh, or something incredibly relevant to the lives of your audience on the air. Look at the success of Rooster Teeth, After Buzz, Rob Has a Podcast. These networks and shows have shown us that there is an enormous thirst for aftermarket podcasts about TV shows. Now imagine that you have an FM station and it's kind of scuffling. It's just outside the top five, 18 to 34, but it's not quite able to maintain that success. You're trying to reach an 18 to 34 audience, can't quite do it with the music. It's Monday night at 10 p.m. You could keep the format, you could play that Cardi B song again, or you could feature a Bachelor After Show podcast. People are watching The Bachelor live, and a shared experience podcast right after it might just be more compelling than keeping format in a time when very few 18 to 34s are listening to any radio at all in the evening, let alone your station. And all of this leads to my last point, and that is to follow the audience and put success in your way. One of the most popular overnight syndicated radio programs is Coast to Coast AM. It's a delightfully wacky stew of conspiracy theories, alien abductions, and the paranormal. Uh, The hour before the show on most of the stations on which it's syndicated, it's kind of a programming wasteland. It's not a great hour. What if, instead, we just acknowledge the taste of the audience available to that show at that time, leaned into it, and let in with the White Vault, or Lore, or Bridgewater, I mean, isn't Bridgewater pretty much better than anything on the radio right now? Just like NBC brought us must-see TV, a tightly programmed block of, let's say, true crime podcasts could kick off the weekend on a radio station. It could usher in a whole new era of don't get murdered Fridays. I don't know. But creating destinations around an audience segment, that's how music radio has been programmed for decades. I'm just saying that we owe podcasts the same care. It could work if we are intentional, focused, and respect the ingredients of this stew, which is the individual podcasts themselves. And I'll close with this story. It stayed with me for years. I've had the utter privilege to conduct audience research for the past couple of decades for literally the most listened to shows, podcasts, and radio stations in the world. I've had a pretty good lucky streak in my career. At one point uh, early in that career, I worked for a radio station in Tokyo that had a weekly audience of over 7 million people. That's double the national audience for The Bachelor, by the way, in one city. Uh, The station was called J-Wave, and it was unusual to me because rather than hewing to kind of one tightly programmed format for 24 hours, it featured block programming where every hour or two was completely different. It's not unlike TV in that way. And every afternoon during the week, At about, you know, tea time, J-Wave aired a block of opera music, and it was called uh, something like the Shiseido Cosmetics Hour. Shiseido Cosmetics was in the title of it. They owned the whole thing. And I remember asking someone on the programming staff, why opera? Well, because that's what Shiseido wants to play, I was told, and they were funding the whole shebang. Well, okay, I said, but aren't you worried about derailing the whole station over one sponsor? The answer, I was surprised to hear, was that Shiseido had done a lot more research on women 25 to 54 than the radio station had, and they had reams of data on the available audience for the show at that time. And it turns out, they liked hearing opera in the afternoon, and they liked buying high-end Shiseido cosmetics. And who are we to argue? Today, many podcasters know their audiences much better than some radio stations do. Podcasts on the radio, some podcasts on the radio might prove to be mutually beneficial for both parties, but only if the show and not the medium is the star, if the neighborhood is friendly, and if the audience is right. And by the way, the audience is always right. 
I'm Tom Webster. This has been I Hear Things for Thursday, September 2nd, 2021. I'll see you next week.